Chapter twenty six of Joan Thursday by Lewis Joseph Vance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. And then, suddenly, the face of life was indescribably changed. Joan Thursday seemed but a memory, a slight and somewhat wistful shadow in the shadowed depths of that darkling mirror yesterday. In her place, another creature altogether reigned the joan cord of to-day woman actress wife with a gold band round her finger mature initiate of mysteries ripe in wisdom strong poised serenely clear of eye with added graciousness in her beauty conscious of added powers over man but discreet in their employment she thought a great deal about herself in those days not perhaps more than had been common with her in that so dead yesterday but much and more profoundly reading to a new meaning into the riddle of existence so changed had all things become since her marriage before her pensive vision life unfolded rare golden vistaed promises with another man or in another stratum of society she might have fulfilled herself wonderfully even unto her salvation to begin with she was very happy fond to distraction of her husband she never doubted that he worshipped her he gave her quick wits no cause to entertain a doubt they were together always inseparable she felt that nature must truly have fashioned them solely for one another and could not forget her wonder that their passion should be so mutual so complete she loved him to distraction all his traits his robust swagger his sonorous and flexible tones the flowery eloquence of his gesture his broad easy-going tolerant good humour the way he wore his clothes and the very cut and texture of them and she ruled him like a despot cord submitted without complaint she was all his fancy had painted her and something more recognising dimly that she excelled him variously although he was quite incapable of analysing these distinctions he served her humbly with unconscious deference to her many excellences she was by way of making him a better wife than he deserved if at times conscious of some little irk from her amiable but inflexible autocracy he reminded himself that she was a finer woman than any he had ever known well worth humouring it wasn't on every corner a fellow'd pick up one like joan he liked to follow her into hotel lobbies and restaurants and watch people turn to eye her the men with sudden interest the women with instinctive hostility it even amused him to quell a too ambitious stare with a fixed grim and truculent regard backed by the menace of his powerful physique it gave a man standing license to swagger to own a woman like joan he came to pander oddly to this vanity would leave joan to go to their room alone while he strolled off to a bar to meet some crony or acquaintance of the day tell his best story and then suddenly excuse himself well slong the wife's waiting for me the response rarely failed ah let her wait have another drink did i ever tell you a lifted deprecatory palm a knowing look no guess i'll kick along to see she's some wife conscious only of his adoration joan was enchanted by their mode of life with its constant shifts of scene its spice of vagabondage she believed she could never tire of travelling railroad journeys with their inevitable concomitants of dirt noise and discomfort never discouraged her she really liked them they were taking her somewhere it didn't much matter where she even derived a sort of pleasure from such nauseating experiences as rising to catch a train at four thirty in the morning against their long jumps and there was keen delight in napping in a parlor car chair or with the head upon her husband's shoulder in a day coach to wake all drowsy breathe air foul with coal smoke and peer through a black window pane shadowed by her hand to catch a glimpse of some darkly fulgent breadth of strange water or the marching defile of great alien hills or a sweep of semi-wooded countryside bleached with moonlight remembering that only a few short months ago the world of her travels had been bounded by fort george on the north coney island on the south knowing neither east nor west 
she was discovering america even as she was discovering life their route from trenton took them south through philadelphia wilmington baltimore washington richmond and norfolk whence they doubled back by steamer to new york took a sound boat to fall river played boston and drifted through new england in bitter cold weather eventually striking westward again via albany buffalo and the middle country quard drew her attention to the fact that it was a liberal education sometimes she thought pityingly of matthias and wondered if he knew she was married and what she was doing and whether he were angry or heartbroken or eaten up with morbid jealousy and how he would act should chance ever throw them together again she was sorry for him he had lost her if only he had been a little more enterprising she wondered what would have happened if matthias had been more enterprising he could have possessed her at any time during the brief period of their infatuation if he had married her then would she be as contented as she was now with charlie she doubted it quard was so completely his opposite she ceased to worry about the ring she meant to return it some day perhaps though she did not wear it and had never so much as mentioned matthias to quard it remained a possession whose charms tugged at her heart-strings at times she amused herself formulating idle little intrigues with the object if ever set in motion of excusing the appearance of the jewel upon her hand but all her schemes seemed to possess some fatal flaw and she was desperately afraid of the truth meanwhile the ring lay perdue at the bottom of a work-basket of woven sweet grass which she had purchased shortly after her marriage twisted in an old empty needle-paper and mixed in with a worthless confusion of trash such as women accumulate in such receptacles its hiding-place was well calculated to escape detection by even an informed purloiner cord's tardy engagement ring was set with an inferior diamond flanked by artificial pearls joan despised it secretly for a long time it was the sole blemish on the bright shield of her happiness and then the night of their opening day in cincinnati cord escorted her from the theatre to the hotel left her at the door and turned back to see a friend who happened to be playing on the same bill this was quite the usual thing and joan went contentedly off to her room and in due course to bed confident that cord would return within an hour five hours later she awoke to startled apprehension of the facts first that she must have dropped off to sleep without meaning to next that quard had not returned finally that it was past four o'clock in the morning with a little shiver of sickening premonition she rose slipped into a dressing-gown called a bell-boy and instructed him to look for her husband some time later the boy reported that the bar was closed and the gentleman were not to be found it was broad daylight when quard staggered in with the assistance of the same bell-boy and his negro dresser his eyes were glazed his face ghastly his mind wandered he was as helpless as a child with the aid of the boys joan managed to undress the man and put him to bed at once he fell asleep with the cold stump of a half-burned cigar obstinately clenched between his teeth it was an hour before the muscles of his jaw relaxed enough to release it dressing joan left the hotel swallowed some coffee and rolls tasteless to her in a nearby restaurant and wandered about until eight o'clock when she found a drug store open and consulted the clerk he advised bromo seltzer and aromatic spirits of ammonia armed with these she returned to her husband and shortly after noon daring to delay no longer roused him by sprinkling cold water in his face all other methods having failed even to interrupt his stertorous breathing even then it was some time before she could induce him to swallow the medicine and it required no less than three powerful doses together with much black coffee and followed by a cold bath to restore him to presentable condition in the end however she succeeded in getting him to the theatre in time for the matinee through it all she uttered no single word of reproach but waited on the man with at least every outward sign of sympathy and devotion his remorse when another nap at the hotel after the matinee 
had brought him to more complete realization of what had happened was touching and as long as it lasted unquestionably sincere joan accepted without comment his lame explanation as to the manner of his temptation and fall during an all-night session at poker with the boys and gave genuine credulity to his protestations that it would never never happen again but three weeks later in chicago he repeated the performance though under somewhat less distressing circumstances as before he left her in the lobby to finish his cigar and chin with so-and-so within an hour he was half led half carried to the room in a hopelessly sodden condition the actor with whom he had been drinking accompanied him apparently quite sober but puzzled and after quard had been helped to bed explained to the girl that her husband's collapse had been incomprehensibly due to no more than three drinks i have never seen nothing like it the man expostulated with an air of grievance there he was standing up against the bar with his foot on the rail laughing and kidding same's the rest of us and he'd only had three whiskies though i will say they was man-sized drinks and then all of a sudden he turns white as a sheet and starts mumbling to himself and we all thinks he's joshing until he keels over limps a rag if the stuff gets to him like that he's got no business touching it ever these experiences continued at varying intervals and presently joan began to understand that cord had not only primarily a weakness to tempt him but a constitutional inability to assert his will-power after he had surrendered to the extent of a single drink one modest dose of alcohol seemed to exercise upon him a sort of hypnotic power driving him on whether he would or not to the next the next and the next until the nadir of unconsciousness was reached it was not that he invariably succumbed to moderate indulgence but that once started he rarely stopped until his identity was completely submerged indeed the way of alcohol with him seemed never twice to follow the same route but its end was invariably the same hoping against hope fighting with him pleading reasoning threatening with him even praying joan endured for a long time much longer than in retrospective days seemed possible even to her for she was honestly fond of her husband far more so than she was ever of any other living being save herself they reached san francisco the third week in april for some time quard had been drinking rather methodically but stealthily a threat made by joan while he was sobering up from his last debauch to the effect that on repetition of the offence she would leave him without an hour's notice had frightened the man to the extent of making him hesitate to add one drink to another except at intervals long enough to retard the cumulative effect but never a day passed on which in spite of her watchfulness he did not contrive to throw several sops to the devil in possession if without ever quite losing his wits detected with reeking breath he would adopt one or three attitudes he was a man subject to the domination of no woman and of no appetite had learned his lesson and now knew when to stop or he was sorry hadn't stopped to think and wouldn't let it go any further or nothing of the sort had happened he had drunk nothing except a glass of soda fountain nerve tonic or possibly it was his cigar that she smelled with the first joan had no patience and since she had a temper it was the last resort in quard's more sober stages seldom employed save when potations had made him either indifferent or vicious in his contrition whether real or assumed she tried hard to believe but his lies never deceived her to these she listened in the silence of contempt and despair on the wednesday afternoon of their week in san francisco the girl did a bit of shopping after the matinee it was half after five before she returned to the hotel and walked into their room to find quard with his coat off seated in a chair that faced the door his back was to the windows through which the declining sun threw a flood of blinding golden light so that joan's dazzled vision comprehended only the dark silhouette of his body she said hello dearie lightly enough in the abstraction of reviewing some especially pleasing purchases closed the door walked over to the bureau 
put down her handbag and a small parcel and removed her hat then the fact that quard had not answered penetrated her reverie disposing of her hat she looked half casually over her shoulder to discover that he hadn't moved two surmises struck through her wonder that he had fallen asleep waiting for her with poignant apprehension that he had been drinking again but this seemed hardly likely he had been entirely rational and unintoxicated during the matinee she said sharply what's the matter quard made no answer with a troubled sigh she moved to his chair and bent over him his eyes wide and blazing met hers with a look of inflexible hostility and rage his mouth was set like a trap his lips like his face were almost colourless the air was pungent with his breath but intuitively she divined that it was not drunkenness alone which had aroused this temper the more dismaying since it was for the time being under control from the look in his eyes she started back as from a blow charlie what's the matter quard opened his lips gulped spasmodically closed them without speaking the muscles on the left side of his face twitched nervously abruptly he shot up out of his chair strode to the door locked it and pocketed the key his face as he turned was terrible to see she shrank away but his eyes held hers in the fascination of fright why charlie what he interrupted with an imperative gesture took a step toward her and shook his hand in her face between his thumb and forefinger glittered something exquisitely coruscant in the sunlight what's that he demanded in a quivering voice she moved her head and assumed bewilderment staggered to recognize the symbol of her broken troth with matthias i don't know what is it you keep moving it around so i can't see there then he cried steadying the hand under her nose instinctively her gaze veered to her trunk its lid was up on the floor lay her work-basket in the litter of its former contents her indignation mounted what were you doing in my trunk she demanded hotly quard's eyes clouded under the impact of this counter-attack momentarily his dazed expression made it very plain that he had taken advantage of her absence to drink heavily and this was even more plain in the blurred accents robbed of the sharpness rage had lent them in which he endeavoured to justify himself i wanted shoe on spender button wanted work basket anger returned his voice mounted and i found this what is it joan snatched at the ring but he drew back his hand too quickly for her it's mine give it to me where'd you get it that's what i want to know none of your business give it to hell it ain't my business i'm your husband got a right to know where you get diamonds he sneered diamonds like this i never bought it no she flamed back you're too stingy stingy am i he faltered swaying that's enough i'm tight what so's another guy gets chance to buy you diamonds that's the way of it hey you give me that ring charlie joan demanded ominously you've got another good guest coming what i'll give you is just two minutes to tell me the name of the fellow give it to you don't be a fool charlie i don't intend to be a fool any longer you tell me or he checked searching his befuddled mind for a compelling threat with a shift of manner joan extended her hand in pleading give me the ring charlie and be sensible i haven't done anything wrong i can explain well grudgingly he dropped the ring into her palm but immediately her fingers had closed upon it mistrust again possessed him now you tell me very well she interrupted patiently you needn't shout i don't mind telling you now it's my engagement ring your what sharply my engagement ring i was engaged last summer to mr matthias before we began to rehearse the sketch engaged he iterated stupidly engaged for what engaged to be married he was in love with me 
i meant to marry him until you and i met the second time meant to marry who mr matthias we matthias what matthias john matthias the author the playwright he wrote the jade god cord wagged his head cunningly you mean to tell me you was engaged to that guy and didn't marry him certainly i married you didn't i dear and if that's true how'd happen you didn't give him back his ring eh i meant to charlie but he was out of town and i didn't know his address that's likely the actor laughed harshly that's good one that is you going to marry him and didn't know his address expect me to believe that it's true charlie it's god's truth you're a liar charlie i say you're a liar or more i mean it quard waved his hand palm down to indicate his scornful disposition of her yarn then he staggered steadied himself by clutching the back of a chair and conscious how this betrayed his condition worked himself into a towering rage to cover it i ain't no better if you'd ever got a chance to marry that feller you'd have jumped at it he never got away you wouldn't have given him no more chance than he did me you'd have pulled wool over his eyes same way i know what i'm talking about you're a liar damn dirty little liar that's what you are joan's color deserted her face entirely charlie don't you say that to me again and what do you do think i care i know what you'll do all right because i'm gonna make you do it what do you mean what's more i know now who gave you that ring i was fool not to guess it before i didn't give it to you no miss matthias didn't give it to you no but somebody did give it to you eh that's right isn't it and his name his name was vincent marbridge wasn't it he thrust his inflamed face close to hers leering wickedly marbridge joan echoed blankly vincent marbridge that's the feller to give you the ring he's the feller could do it too got all the money in the world enough to buy dozens of rings enough to buy you all them good clothes you got hold after you threw me down and before i was ass enough to take up with you again of that you were a fool not to get more out of him the insult ate like an acid into the pride of the girl she flushed crimson then in an instant paled again her eyes grew cold and hard that will do she said bitterly you've said enough too much after all i've endured from you your drunkenness your there was a maniac glare in the eyes of the man as he thrust his face still closer and what'll you do eh he shouted violently what'll you do she turned her face aside in disgust of his reeking breath and what'll you do tell me that i'll leave you you bet your life you'll leave me i knew that before you come into this room and i'm sorry i didn't go long ago the hell you are in a gust of uncontrollable frenzy cord struck her sharply over the mouth you go do you hear you damn in blind fury joan flung herself upon him sobbing biting scratching kicking he reeled back before that unexpected assault then sobered a trifle by its viciousness caught her wrists held her helpless for an instant and threw her violently from him she fell to her knees lurched over on her side the door slammed he was gone she knew the man too well not to know he would make instantly for the nearest bar the only question was what guise intoxication would assume in him this time it was possible that he would drink himself raving mad and return fit for murder she must make her escape with all possible expedition instantly joan sat up dried her eyes convulsively swallowed her sobs and felt of her bruised mouth before her on the carpet the diamond ring winked sardonically in the sunset light she pondered savagely the wide and deep damnation it had wrought in her life 
it seemed impossible that only a few minutes had elapsed since she had entered this room an affectionate patient and not unhappy wife now she sifted her heart and found in it not one grain of the love it had once held for quard this alone would have rendered irrevocable her decision to leave him the thing was over settled finished she gave a gesture of finality with all her heart she hoped that the sketch would go to the devil without her rising she went to the mirror to stare incredulously at the face it presented for her inspection a cruel caricature lined distorted lousy stained with tears at this vision hysteria threatened again with a great effort she fought it down and controlled and smoothed out the muscles of her face now she was more recognizable even her mouth was not seriously disfigured he had struck with the flat of his hand only her lips were sore and slightly but not markedly swollen a veil would disguise them completely at the washstand she devoted some very valuable moments to sopping her face with cold water and particularly her mouth and eyes the treatment toned down the inflammation of weeping rendered her flesh firm and cool once more and left her with a feeling of spiritual refreshment with nerves again under control and her will even more inalterably fixed than before rouge and powder completed her rejuvenescence turning to her trunk she took out the tray and paused with a low cry of consternation from the tumbled and disordered state of its contents it was plain that having discovered the ring quard had searched diligently for further confirmation of his suspicions with quickening breath the girl dropped to her knees and hastily but thoroughly ransacked and turned out upon the floor all her belongings within a brief period she satisfied herself of one appalling fact quard had not only insulted and struck her and cast her off he had stooped to rob her her hands were tied she had not money enough to leave him probably with the low cunning and fallacious reasoning of dipsomania he had pouched her savings with that very thought in mind meaning to break with her to have his scene and satisfy his lust for brutality he had also planned to prevent jones leaving the cast of the lie until a successor could be found and broken in penniless he had argued she would be obliged to play on at least until saturday to earn her fare back east it was quard's practice to carry his money in large bills folded in a belt of oiled silk which he wore buckled round his waist beneath his underclothing with a smaller fund for running expenses in a leather billfold more excessively disposed but joan finding a money belt uncomfortable because of her corsets had adopted the shiftless plan of secreting her savings in a pocket contrived for that purpose in an old underskirt and since she had always held her husband rigidly to account for her individual fifty dollars per week she had managed thus to set aside about three hundred dollars unfortunately it had been their habit to carry duplicate keys to one another's luggage by way of provision against loss so that now she was left with less than twenty dollars in her pocket-book she paced the floor in wrathful meditation pondering means and expedients once or twice she noticed the ring but passed it several times before she paused picked it up and abstractedly placed it on her finger it did not once occur to her that she could raise money by hypothecating the jewel at a pawn-shop by hook or crook she was determined to regain her own money she was wondering what good it would do her to threaten cord with the rest had a wife any right to her earnings under the law after a time she opened her handbag found her personal bunch of keys and unlocked her husband's trunk her pains however went for nothing she investigated diligently every pocket of his clothing without discovering a piece of money of any description but one thing she did find to make her thoughtful quard's revolver removing this last she relocked the trunk and rang for a bell-boy then she put the weapon on the bureau and covered it with her hat the youth who had answered had an intelligent look joan appraised him narrowly before trusting him she opened negotiations with a dollar tip 
i want you to find my husband for me she said if he's anywhere around the hotel he'll probably be in the bar but look everywhere and then come and tell me you needn't say anything to him i just want to know where he is do you understand yes ma'am you'd know him if you saw him mr quard the actor yes ma'am that's all hurry as soon as the boy was gone she turned again to her luggage selecting indispensable garments and toilet articles and packing them in a suitcase by the time a knock sounded again upon the door she had the case strapped and locked he ain't nowhere about the house ma'am the bellboy reported he was in the bar a while but he's gone out joan nodded was dumb in thought do you want as i should go look for a man can you leave the hotel joan asked quickly i'm just going off duty now ma'am the night shift came on about ten minutes ago at six o'clock and you think you could possibly find him he took a cab ma'am the driver's stand is in front of the hotel if i can find him i can find where your husband went anyhow it ain't hard to follow up a gentleman as as drunk joan put in when the boy hesitated yes ma'am joan weighed the chance distrustfully but it was at least a chance and this was no time to be careful taking a five-dollar gold piece from her scanty store she gave it to the boy go find him she said and if he seems to know what he's doing just hang around until he doesn't he won't keep you waiting long then bring him to me but first take the suitcase down to the union ferry house check it in the baggage room and give me the check when you bring him back and don't say anything to anybody yes ma'am no ma'am supperless she sat down to wait quard's revolver ready to her hand twilight waned night fell hours passed motionless and imperturbable joan waited on the tensity of her mood betrayed only by the burning of her baleful dangerous eyes at half past nine a noise of scuffling feet gruff voices and heavy breathing in the hallway following the clash of an elevator gate brought her to her feet going to the bureau she opened a drawer and put the revolver away there would be no need of that now answering a knock she threw the door wide two porters staggered in one with the shoulders one with the feet of cord the bell-boy followed when they had lugged to the bed that inert and insensate thing she had once loved joan tipped the men and they departed the boy lingered is there anything more i can do ma'am where did you find him down on the coast i don't know what wouldn't have happened to him if you hadn't sent me after him he was up an alley had been stuck up by a couple of strong arms i seen him making the getaway just as i come in sight she uttered a cry of despair robbed you mean yes ma'am he ain't got as much as a nickel on him overwhelmed joan sank into a chair the boy avoided her desolate eyes he was a little afraid she might want part of the five dollars back hadn't i better send the hotel doctor up ma'am perhaps she muttered dully yes ma'am and here's the check for your suitcase nothing else good night ma'am the door closed of a sudden joan jumped up and ran to the bed in the alcove cord's condition was pitiable but in her excited no compassion his face was pallid as a death mask save on one cheekbone where there was an angry and livid contusion his hands were scratched bleeding and filthy his clothing begrimed and torn his pockets turned inside out he seemed scarcely to breathe and a thin froth flecked his slack and swollen lips with feverish haste she unbuttoned his shirt and trousers and tugged at his undershirt then she sobbed aloud a short dry sob of relief she had discovered the money belt in another minute she had unbuckled and withdrawn it from his body she took it to the other room to the light and hastily undid its fastenings there were perhaps two dozen fresh new bills for the most part of large denominations folded once lengthwise to fit into the narrow silken tube but someone knocked before she found time to reckon up their sum hastily cramming the money together with the tell-tale belt into her handbag joan took a deep breath and said come in 
there entered a grave man of middle age carrying a physician's satchel he said with a slight inclination of his head mrs cord i believe yes joan gasped she nodded toward the alcove your patient's in there he murmured some acknowledgment turning away to the bedside for several minutes he worked steadily over the drunkard while she waited her wits a whirl joan mechanically pinned on her hat presently the physician stepped back into the room removed his coat turned back his cuffs and produced a pocket hypodermic with narrowing eyes he recognized joan's preparations for the street is he all right doctor she said with a faint of doubt and fear he's in pretty bad shape but i guess we can pull him round all right but i need your help you were going out she met his eyes steadily i was only waiting to hear how he was i've got to hurry off to the theatre i'm late now if we miss the performance to-night we may lose our booking and he's just been held up all we've got's what's coming to us next saturday i see and you can do without him his understudy'll take his part we'll manage somehow then i am afraid i shall have to call in assistance a trained nurse do please doctor very well he moved toward the telephone i'll be back in about an hour very well mrs quard he stared perplexed at the door when she had shut it avoiding the elevator and lobby she slipped down the stairs and through a side door to the street in ten minutes she was at the union ferry within an hour she was in oakland purchasing through tickets for her transcontinental flight End of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Rourke. when he had finished breakfast matthias lighted a pipe and setting his feet anew in the groove they had worn diagonally from door to window began his matutinal tramp toward inspiration but this morning found his brain singularly sluggish thoughts would not come or if they showed themselves at all it was only to peer mischievously at him round some distant corner which when turned discovered only an empty impasse distressed he tamped down his pipe ran long fingers through his hair and wrapped himself in clouds of smoke then a breath of cool sweet air fanned his cheek and he looked round in sharp annoyance it was like that fool maid to leave the windows open and freeze him to death and truly enough they were both wide open from top to bottom though for all that he wasn't freezing and outside there was a bright crimson border of potted geraniums on the iron railed balcony he hadn't noticed them before madame de prat must have set them out before he was up curious whim of hers curious weather disliking inconsistencies he stopped in one of the windows to investigate these unseasonable phenomena in one corner of the back yard a dilapidated bundle of fur and bones conforming in general with a sardonic post-impressionist candid opinion of a tomcat lay blinking lazily in a patch of warm yellow sunlight in the next back yard a ridiculous young person in bare legs blue denim overalls and a small red sweater was industriously turning up the earth with a six-inch trowel and chanting cheerfully to himself an improvisation in honour of his garden that was to be at an open window across the way a public-spirited and extremely pretty young woman appeared with a towel pinned round her shoulders and let down her hair a shimmering cascade of gold for the sun's rays to wanton with and incidentally to dry somewhere at a distance a cracked old piano organ was romping and giggling rapturously through the syncopated measures of ten pan alley's latest rag a vision drifted before matthias's eyes of the green slopes of tanglewood the white chateau on its windy headland the ineffable blue of the sound beyond incredulous he turned to consult his calendar the day was wednesday the seventeenth of april it was true then almost without his knowledge the bleak and barren winter had worn away and spring had stolen upon town 
flaunting extravagant shy and seductive irresistible spring for a little matthias held back in doubt with reluctant thoughts of his work then all in a breath he caught up hat and stick slammed the door behind him and blundered forth to fulfil his destiny she was seated on a bench in a retired spot sheltered from the breeze open to the sun when matthias having swung round the upper reservoir came at full stride down the west drive his blood romping his eyes aglow warm colour in his face for the first time in half a year feeling himself again matthias the lover of the open skies divorced from matthias of the midnight lamp and the scored and intricate manuscripts that matthias whom the world rejected at a word her companion rose and moved to intercept him and at the sound of his name matthias paused wondering who she could be the strange sweet-faced woman plainly dressed yes he said lifting his hat i am mr matthias yes mrs marbridge would like to speak to you his gaze veered quickly in the direction indicated by her brief nod he saw venetia waiting and immediately went to her in his surprise forgetful of the woman who had accosted him this last moved slowly in the other direction and sat down out of earshot this is awfully good of you venetia he said bending over her hand i didn't see you of course was thinking of something else but i was thinking of you she said i've been wanting to see you for a long time jack surely helena could have told you where to find me i knew we'd run across one another somehow somewhere sometime to-day or to-morrow without fail so i was content to do without the offices of helena do sit down i want so much to talk to you most completely yours to command he said lightly and took the place beside her but his heart was on his lips and in his eyes and venetia was far from blind then tell me about yourself she asked it's been so long since i've had any news is it possible i should have imagined my doting aunt she interrupted with a slight negative smile and shake of her head helena doesn't approve of me you know and of late there has been a decided coolness between the families i'm afraid george fell out with vincent for some reason not too hard to guess perhaps he looked away colouring with embarrassment so she pursued evenly about yourself are you married yet matthias started laughed frankly you didn't know about that either well it's true even helena couldn't have told you much for i told her nothing no i'm neither married nor like to be she was so very sweet and pretty joan was wholly charming he agreed gravely but well i fancy it was inevitable we were lucky enough to be obliged to endure a separation of some weeks before instead of after marriage and so we had time to think at least she must have foreseen the mistake we were on the point of making for the break was her own doing not mine you think it would have been a mistake oh unquestionably i confess i'd not have known it probably until too late if she hadn't made me think when she threw me over i hope it doesn't sound caddish but i was conscious of a distinct sense of relief when i got back from california and found she cleared out without leaving me a line i think i understand and did you never hear from her not from by accident of her she was predestined for the stage i can see that clearly now though i objected then she was offered a chance during my absence jumped at it and made a sort of a half-way hit in a very successful sketch which oddly enough i happened to have written under a pseudonym it had been kicking round my agent's office for a year he didn't believe in it any more than i did and i disbelieved in it hard enough to be ashamed to put my own name to it that's often the way with a fellow's work one always believes in the cripples you know well some actor chanced to get hold of the script one day fell in love with it and put it on with joan as his leading woman if it had been anybody else's sketch i'd never have known what became of her probably as it was i knew nothing until i got back from the coast i believe they got married very shortly after it was produced 
and now they're playing it all over the country odd isn't it very venetia smiled and so your heart wasn't broken he shook his head and laughed <laughs> no but a spasm of pain shot through his eyes and deceived the woman a little longer and what have you been doing she pursued meaning to distract him i mean your work he shrugged oh i've had an average luckless year to begin with right out fell down on its production of the jade god the only time it ever had a chance to get over and a man named algerson bought his contract and put it on at his stock theatre in los angeles that's why i went out there to see it butchered it failed extravagantly but didn't you once have a great deal of confidence in it every play is a valuable property until it's produced he answered smiling this one was killed by its production nothing was right it needed scenery and what they gave it had served a decade in stock it needed actors and what actors were accidentally permitted to get into the cast got the wrong roles finally it needed intelligent stage direction and that was supplied by the star whose idea of a good play is one in which he speaks everybody's lines and his own then they rewrote most of the best scenes and botched them horribly you couldn't stop them when i attempted to interfere i was told civilly to go to the devil under my contract i could have stopped them but that meant suing out an injunction which in turn meant putting up a bond and i didn't have the money i'm so sorry jack oh it's all in the game i learned something at least but the greatest harm it did me was to sap the faith of managers here one man wiley who was under contract to produce my tomorrow's people paid me on january first a forfeit of five hundred dollars rather than run the risk after the jade god and so you lost both plays oh no i still have tomorrow's people and only a short time ago signed up with a manager who isn't afraid of his shadow we'll put it on next autumn and you believe in that too i know it will go matthias asserted with level confidence it's only a question of intelligence at the producing end and i've arranged to get that and meanwhile you've been working oh he spread out his hands one doesn't stop you know it's too interesting and then he laughed again but you see you flatter a fellow into talking his head off about himself forgive me and let me do a little cross-examining how are you and what have you been doing you you know venetia you're looking more exquisitely pretty than ever and so she was more strangely lovely than ever in all the long span of their friendship with a deeper radiance in her face a clearer more translucent pallor in her eyes a splendor that lent new dignity to their violet shadowed mystery i'm glad of that she said quietly she folded listless hands in her lap her eyes seeking distances i'm going to be very happy i think he looked up sharply that she wasn't happy now he could well understand that marbridge was behaving badly was something rather too broadly published by the very publicity of his methods marriage had not been permitted to interfere at least not after his return from europe with the ordinary tenor of his bachelor ways matthias himself had seen him not infrequently in theatres and restaurants but only once in company with venetia most often he had been dancing attendance upon a mrs cardrow she who had given her lips to matthias thinking him marbridge that long ago night at tanglewood she was said to be stage-struck and marbridge was rumoured to be deeply though quietly involved in the financing of certain theatrical enterprises surely then venetia must know what everybody knew and be unhappy in that knowledge but now she was so calmly confident that she was going to be happy he wondered if she were contemplating divorce and then in a flash he understood that woman who had stopped him was not of venetia's caste if he guessed not wildly she was a nurse and venetia afoot instead of in her limousine 
she turned her eyes to his smiling with a certain diffident sweet sedateness you didn't know jack he shook his head looking quickly away but you guessed yes he replied in a low voice her hands fell lightly over his for a single instant then be glad for me jack she begged gently it's it's compensation i understand he said and i'm truly very glad it's kind of you to to tell me venetia it changes everything she said pensively all my world is changed and i am a new strange woman seeing it with new eyes i have learned so much and in so short a time i can hardly believe it to think it's not a year since that time at tanglewood please he begged oh i didn't mean to hurt you jack but it's that i wanted to talk to you about you won't mind when you understand as i have learned to understand i tell you i'm altogether another woman marriage is like learning to live in a foreign land but motherhood is another world i find it difficult to realize venetia of a year ago she's like some strange creature i once knew but never quite understood and yet little as i understood her i can make excuses for her i know her impulses were not bad i know better than she knew she loved you jack you must not say that venetia but it's true my dear most true she insisted in her voice of gentle magic the rest was just madness the sort of madness that some men have the power to to kindle in women it's a deadly power very terrible and they who haven't use it as carelessly as children playing with matches and gunpowder oh i understand venetia i understand don't no let me tell you i've got to jack i've had this so long in my heart to tell you you must be patient with me this once and listen you must know that i loved you then when i ran to you threw myself into your arms made you ask me to marry you and promised i would and and thought that i was safe from him because of my promise but i didn't know myself nor him he seemed able to make his will my law so easily so strangely even when i ran away with him i knew that happiness could never come of it it was just the madness i couldn't help myself i just could not help myself and then ah but i have paid for my madness many times over for the moment he couldn't trust himself to speak the woman bent forward to gain a glimpse of his half-averted face and searched it anxiously with her haunted eyes you do understand jack you forgive there isn't any question of forgiveness he said and i always understood halfway you know that you must have known it or you couldn't have said what you have to me the woman laughed a little tender broken laugh i am so glad she said softly perhaps it's wrong but you've made me a little happier i have needed so desperately someone to confess to someone on whose sympathy i could count and jack the only one in the world was you 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 helped she rose holding out both hands to him and as he took them and held them tight he saw that her lovely eyes were wide and dim with tears you prove my faith in you she said my gentle man my knight sans peur et sans reproche he bent his head to her hands but before his lips could touch them very gently she drew them away and turned and left him bareheaded and wondering for a long time he stood staring at the spot where in company with the nurse she had disappeared End of chapter twenty seven Chapter Twenty Eight of Joan Thursday by Louis Joseph Vance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Macquarie. As soon as the porter had made up the lower berth in the section Joan had reserved for her sole accommodation, in spite of the strain of thrift ingrained in her nature, she retired to it, buttoned securely the heavy plush portieres, and 
prepared for rest by reducing herself to that state of semi-undress in which she had learned to travel by night then by the light of the small electric lamp above her pillow she turned out the contents of her handbag and counted the money she had stolen from quard the sum of it more than twenty of one hundred dollars staggered her she hadn't dreamed that quard possessed so much ready cash carefully folding the bills of larger denomination into a neat flat packet she wrapped them in a handkerchief and hid them in the hollow of her bosom secured by a safety pin to her ribbed silk undervest the remainder more than enough to cover all ordinary expenses en route to new york she disposed of more excessively half in her handbag half in one of her stockings then extinguishing the light she lay back but not to sleep the pressure of her emotions was too strong to let her lose touch with consciousness as a general rule sleeping cars had no terrors for joan never a nervous woman her thoroughly sound and healthy organization permitted her to sleep almost at will even under such discouraging circumstances as those provided by modern railway accommodations but that night she lay awake till dawn till dawn flushed the windows with its wash of grey awake and staring wide of eye into the gloom of her section listening to the snores of conscienceless neighbours and thinking 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 endlessly and acutely but they were thoughts singularly uncoloured by remorse for what she had done or fear of its consequences she was not in the least sorry she had taken quard's money she was glad the mere amount of it was proof enough for joan that her husband had lied to her about the earnings of the sketch had lied from the very beginning otherwise he could by no means have laid by so much in the term of their booking to date and for that he deserved to suffer she was only sorry he might not be made to understand how heavily he was paying for those months of deception but that was something quard would never know with the story of the bell-boy he must be content he must go through life placing the blame of his misfortune upon the heads of those nameless stick-up men of the barbary coast nor was he likely to suffer otherwise joan was confident the man would manage somehow to find his feet financially almost as soon as physically a telegram to his agent boskert would bring him aid if all else failed the play was too constant an earner of heavy commissions for boskert to let it fall by the wayside for lack of a few hundred dollars so was it too strong a draw on the vaudeville circuits to be blacklisted and barred by managers because of the temporary breakdown something which quard would readily explain and excuse and joan could imagine how persuasively with his moving yarn of footpads and knockout drops nor would it be more than a temporary breakdown with quard restored to his senses the absence of the leading woman would prove merely a negligible check joan entertained no illusions as to her indispensability once in denver when she had been out of the cast for two consecutive performances suffering with an ulcerated tooth another actress had gone on and actually read the part from manuscript without materially lessening the dramatic effect of the playlet as a whole other women by the score could be found to fill her place acceptably enough if few as handsomely joan soothed her pride with this reservation the lie would go on its conquering way without her never fear and cord joan curled a lip he wouldn't pine away for her she had come to know too well his shallow bag of tricks and life to him was not life if he lacked one before whose dazzled vision he could air his graces and accomplishments strut and crow and trail a handsome wing in the dust looking back she could see very clearly now how love had waned as soon as lust was sated in the man that night in cincinnati had been the turning point he had refrained from drink only as long as his wife continued to intoxicate his senses and joan in the stifling gloom of her curtain section the girl stretched luxuriously breathed deep and smiled a secret enigmatic smile 
no more than he would she waste herself away with grief and longing she was no longer another's but now her own mistress a free adventurer by the gold band upon her finger licensed to cruise with letters of mark shortly before sunrise she fell asleep still smiling and slept on sweetly well into mid-morning then rising she refreshed herself in the washroom and went to a late breakfast with countenance as clear and firm and bright as if she had never known a wakeful hour the eyes of men followed her wherever she moved and when she was seated alone in her section dreaming over a magazine or gazing pensively out of the window men discovered errands that took them to and fro in her vicinity more often than was warranted by any encouragement she gave them for she gave them none she ignored them every one she was through with man for good and all it was a brand new role and to play it diverted her immensely for the time being she spent the greater part of her waking hours during the next few days planning what she would do with all that money clothes of course figured ever first in these projections and then a suite of rooms at some ostentatious hotel and taxicabs when she went out to call on managers how many times hadn't she heard maisie dean solemnly affirm that a swell front does more to put you in right than anything else hello lifers and again she was pleasurably diverted by a vision of herself extravagantly gowned returning to recount her odyssey to an admiring audience composed of ma edna and perhaps butch at the close of which she would distribute largesse not forgetting to return butch's loan with open-handed interest and go on her way rejoicing pursued by envious benedictions new york received her like a bridegroom clothed in april sunshine as in a suit of golden mail amazingly splendid and joyous after that weary grind of inland towns and cities differing one from another only in degrees of griminess grayness and dullness new york seemed paradise regained to joan she had not believed it could seem so beautiful so magnificent so sensuously seductive in the exaltation of that delirious hour she plunged madly into a department store near the pennsylvania station even before securing lodgings and bought herself a pair of cheap white kid gloves simply for the sheer voluptuousness of possessing once again something newly purchased in new york it was the beginning of an orgy joan hadn't thought how shabby and travel-worn she must seem until she donned those fresh and staring gloves and saw them in relief against the wrinkled and dusty garments she had worn across the continent thoughtful she sought a nearby mirror and looked herself over then shook her head and turned away to check her suitcase at the parcels desk and surrender herself body and mind to the sweet dissipation of clothing herself afresh from top to toe but first of all she visited the hairdressing and manicuring department she meant to be altogether spick and span before venturing forth to woo and win anew this old and misprized lover her new york it was the head saleswoman of the suit department whose remote disdain led joan deeper into extravagance the girl had selected a taffeta costume which while by no means the most expensive or the handsomest in stock possessed the advantage of fitting well her average figure requiring no alterations on paying for it she announced her desire to put it on at once and have her old suit sent home really drawled the saleswoman disappointed in her efforts to induce the girl to buy a higher-priced suit which did require alterations conjuring a pencil from the fastnesses of her back hair she produced an order pad miss what did you say ah thursday thanks what number please is it in the city joan flushed but controlled her impulse to wither and blast this insolent animal the waldorf astoria she said quietly though never once had she ventured within the doors of that establishment and withdrew in triumph to make her change of clothing and having committed herself to this extent she enjoyed ordering everything sent 
to that hotel which in her as yet somewhat naive understanding was synonymous with the last word in the sybaritism of metropolitan life her long experience on the road had served thoroughly to break her in to the ways of hotels however and she betrayed no diffidence in the matter of approaching the room clerk for accommodations nor did she apparently find anything dismaying in the price she was asked to pay for a bedroom with private bath it was only when at length relieved of the attentions of the bell-boy whose unconcealed admiration alone was worth the quarter joan gave him as a tip she had inspected first her new quarters and then herself in a pier-glass that the girl gave herself over to alternate tremors of self-approval and trepidation these last were only increased when she reckoned up the money she had left and appreciated how much she had spent in that one wild afternoon of shopping on the other hand she reminded herself a complete new wardrobe was a necessity to one whose former outfit was lost beyond control quard would never have forwarded the clothing she had left behind in san francisco even if she could have found the effrontery to right end demanded and if she had expended upwards of five hundred dollars since reaching new york there was less extravagance in that than might have been suspected she had purchased cannily in almost every instance and at worst but few things that she could well have done without in that sphere of life to which she felt herself called the excitement of unwrapping those parcels which began presently to arrive in shoals and of reviewing such purchases as she had not worn to the hotel on her back in time completely reassured her it was with the composure of restored self-confidence and esteem that she presently went down to dinner conscious that she was looking her handsome best in a modish afternoon gown she was able to receive the attentions of the head waiter with just the proper degree of indifference to order a simple meal and consume it appreciatively without seeming aware that she dined in strange surroundings but all the while she was consumed with admiration of herself for her audacity as well as with not a little awe-struck in wonder at the child of fortune who in the space of one brief year of less indeed than that full period had risen from the stocking counter of a department store and the squalor and poverty of east seventy sixth street to the dignity of a leading woman and the affluence of lodging at the waldorf true she now lacked an engagement but she had to support her demands for new employment the prestige of a successful season with a lie the vaudeville sensation of the year as quard had truthfully described it need she fret herself with vain questionings of an inscrutable future who had made such amazing progress in so short a time surely she was justified in assuming that the end for her was not yet that she was dedicated to some far richer and more gorgeous destiny than any she had ever conceived in her most wild imaginings she had only to watch herself she was her own sole enemy with her fondness for the admiration of men and their society let them realize that weakness and she was lost doomed to the way too many capable girls had gone to the end of infamy and despair but if only she had the wit and art to make men think her weakness theirs and that much joan was sure she possessed she believed she had learned to know man better than herself she meant to go far now a great deal farther than she had ever thought to go in those quaint far-off days when the crown of her ambition had been to paint her pretty face wear silken tights upon her pretty legs and beat a drum in the chorus of zigfeld's follies End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. After dinner, Joan treated herself to the experience of lounging in one of the corridors of the hotel, the one, she fancied, she wasn't sure, known through the town as Peacock Alley. 
she pretended to be waiting for somebody made her gaze seem more abstracted than demure inwardly she quivered with the excitement the exultation of forming a part of that rich and sensuous scene there were women all about her many women of all ages and from every grade of society alike in one respect alone that they were radiantly dressed and like joan found pleasure in sunning themselves in the soft diffused glow of the many shaded electric lamps as well as in the regard as a rule less shaded of that endless parade of men who moved sometimes alone again with other men more commonly with women continually from one part to another of the hotel muted strains from an excellent orchestra not too near added the final touch of enchantment to this ensemble entranced though indeed seeming little more conscious of her surroundings than one in a day-dream joan was acutely sensitive to all that passed in her vicinity not a woman came within the range of her vision without being critically inspected dissected analyzed catalogued both as to her apparel and as to the foundations for her pretensions to social position or beauty not a man strolled by were he splendid in evening dress or merely smart in the ubiquitous sack suit of the period without being scrutinized and appraised with a minute attention to detail that would have flattered him had it been less covert joan felt the lust for this life burning like a fire through all her being there was nothing she could imagine more desirable than to live always as lived apparently these hundreds of well-groomed high-spirited care-free people she had been steeping her soul in the blandishments of this atmosphere for fully half an hour and was beginning to think it time to return to her room when she was momentarily startled out of her assumed preoccupation by sight of one who hadn't been far from her thoughts at any time since her break with quard he came walking her way from the general direction of the bar with another man both attired as richly as masculine conventions permit in america and not altogether unconscious of the fact each in his way guilty of a mild degree of swagger of the two the one betraying the most ease and freedom from ostentation was one known to joan chiefly through the medium of his portraits published in the morning telegraph and other theatrical organs as arley arlington a producing manager locally famous both for his wit and the shrewdness and success with which he contrived to gauge year in year out public taste in musical comedies broadway had tagged him the only trustworthy friend of the tired business man infrequently arlington adventured in plays without music or dancing but as a rule with far less success his companion the man whom joan felt she had been subconsciously waiting for ever since entering the hotel was vincent marbridge she was impressed with the appositeness of his appearance there to her unexpressed desire this man who had been so plainly struck by her charms at first sight and who was credited with silent partnership in many of arlington's enterprises and comprehending for the first time fully how much she had been subjectively counting on meeting him again and enlisting his sympathies his sympathies at least she steeled herself against the shock of recognition lest she betray her fast-mounting anxiety he must not for a moment be permitted to suspect she considered him anything but the most distant of acquaintances or believed him to have been the anonymous author of that magnificent gift of roses but marbridge passed without seeing her at all events without knowing that he saw her rolling a little as he walked with that individual sway of his body from the hips he leaned slightly toward arlington and gesticulated with immense animation while recounting some inaudible anecdote which seemed to amuse both men mightily and in the swing of his narrative his glance wandering flickered across joan's face and on without in the least comprehending her as anything more than a lay figure in a familiar setting but arlington less distracted looked once keenly and after he had passed turned to look again 
in spite of this balm to her vanity joan flushed with chagrin she knew in her heart that marbridge had not other than inadvertently slighted her yet she felt the cut as keenly as though it had been grossly intentional nevertheless she waited there for many minutes more in the hope that he would return and this time know her at length however she saw the two men again at some distance standing by the revolving doors at the thirty-third street entrance both now wore top-coats and hats marbridge was still talking and arlington listening with the same expression of faintly constrained but on the whole genuine amusement and almost as soon as joan discovered them they were joined by two women in brilliant evening gowns and wraps an instant later the party was feeding itself into the inappeasable hopper of the revolving door and so disappeared a prey to a sudden sensation of intense loneliness and disappointment and with this a trace of jealousy for in spite of the distance she had been able to see that both women were very lovely joan got up and returned to her room an hour later she rose from a restless attempt to go to sleep went to the telephone and asked the switchboard operator to find out whether or not mr vincent marbridge was a guest of the hotel the answer was in the affirmative if modified by the information that the party wasn't in just then intensely gratified the girl went back to bed and promptly fell asleep formulating ingenious schemes to meet marbridge by ostensible accident on the following day she lunched at the hotel spent two fruitless hours in its public corridors between tea-time and time to dress for dinner and another in peacock alley after dinner seeing nothing whatever of marbridge and the day after provided her with a fatiguing repetition of this experience she began to be tremendously bored by this mode of existence to sense the emptiness the vapidity of hotel life for a friendless woman once or twice she revived and let her fancy play about her project to revisit her family in the guise of lady bountiful but only to defer its execution against the time when she could go to them with another engagement to drive home the stupendous proportions of her success besides she told herself they seemed to be worrying along without her all right if they carried anything about her they could have written at least edna had the west forty-sixth street address not once or twice but many a time and oft she found herself yearning back to the homely society of the sisters dean's salon in the establishment of madame de prat and though she held back from revisiting the house through fear of meeting matthias she wasted many an hour promenading broadway from thirty-eighth street north to forty-eighth in the hope of encountering maisie or may or one of their friends but it was singularly her fate to espy not one familiar face among the multitude her wistful eyes reviewed during those dreary mid-afternoon patrols everybody she knew it would seem was either busy or resting out of town on her fourth morning at the waldorf reading the morning telegraph over the breakfast tray in her room joan ran across an illuminating news item that carried a buffalo date line it chronicled the first performance of arlington's most recent venture mrs mixer announced as a satirical comedy of manners by an author unknown either to joan or to fame and projected by arlington as a vehicle to exploit the putative talents of nella cardrow the stage's latest recruit from the four hundred the buffalo performance was it appeared the first of a fortnight's trial on the road following which the production was to be withdrawn pending a metropolitan debut in the autumn the story of the first night was infused with a thinly sarcastic humour after the final curtain it pursued the audience filed reverently from the house omitting flowers and arley arlington broke a track record reaching the nearest western union office to summon several well-known anti-mortem specialists of new york to the bedside of the patient meanwhile vincent marbridge was hastily organized into a posse of one to prevent undertaker kane from laying hands upon the sufferer and carting it off to what might prove premature interment in the mausoleum of his celebrated storage warehouses 
dropping the paper joan went directly to the telephone and asked the office to have her bill ready within an hour's time from this she turned to pack her new possessions in a trunk as new it had never occurred to her that marbridge might have left the hotel now she said that it was just her luck by one o'clock that afternoon she had shifted bag and baggage to a stuffy and poorly furnished bedchamber in a crowded noisy and not over-clean theatrical hotel situated on a corner of longacre square this establishment consisted of an old and rambling structure of four stories of which the street floor was given over to tradesmen an all-night drug store held the corner shop while other subdivisions were occupied by a tonsorial parlor a dairy lunch room in the favor of many taxicab chauffeurs a boot-blacking business and a theatrical hairdresser's next door off broadway stood one of those reticent brownstone residences with perennially shuttered windows and a front door to all appearances hermetically sealed but negotiable none the less to those whom fortune had favored with the password and sufficient money and witlessness to make them welcome with proprietors of crooked gambling layouts across the street rose the side wall of a theatre decorated with an angular iron fire escape the day was almost unseasonably warm but the hour appointed when the city should blossom out in awnings had not arrived joan's room was hot with sunlight that mercilessly enhanced the shabbiness of all its appointments from the stained and threadbare carpet to the cheap bureau with its mottled dark mirror and the scorched and blistered edges of its top where cigarettes had been suffered to burn out forgotten but when joan had unpacked and disposed of her belongings she went to the window as she was in a loose kimono generously open at the throat and stood there for a long time contentedly looking out taxicabs darted or stood with motors sonorously rumbling in the street below round the corner longacre square roared with the traffic of its several lines of surface cars and its unending procession of motor-driven vehicles the windows of the theatre across the way were open and through them drifted the clatter of a piano with a surge of half a hundred feminine voices repeating over and over the burden of a chorus betraying the fact that a rehearsal was in progress at one of the open fire escape exits lounged a youth in his shirt-sleeves smoking a cigarette and conversing amiably with a young woman in a stiffly starched white shirtwaist ankle-length skirt and brazen hair principles joan surmised waiting for their turn when the chorus had learned its business acceptably nearer at hand in the room to the right of jones a woman with a good voice was humming absently an aria from la tosca while to the left another woman was audible her strained and nervous accents stuttering on in an endless monologue of abuse evidently aimed at the head of a husband who if he had been drinking again retained at least wit enough to attempt no sort of interruption or rejoinder joan smiled in comprehension breathing long and deep of tepid air flavored strongly with dust and the effluvia of dead cigars and cigarettes she turned away from the window lifted her arms and spread them wide luxuriously thank god she murmured with profound sincerity for a place you can stretch in End of chapter twenty nine